All right. I'm sure there were some technical issues today. <laughs> Uh, I know the IT, the IT guys are work closely with me, so I was like, how's it going? They're like, <laughs> they're just trying their best. Okay, and so we are live, and we got the 200 TC mic going, and should be ready to go. Okay, great. So, um, let me go ahead and the Hey guys, uh, welcome. And uh, just out sort of curiosity, I kind of over start overhearing. We got some uh, special teachers, special needs teachers, special education, IT directors. But just out of curiosity, um, what kind of fields are you guys coming from, and uh, what areas are are your expertise? I'm kind of curious to know there. So, um, well, yeah. I'm, I was a, an MA teacher. Okay, awesome. Um, we we're just talking about that. So yeah, um, I, I I do have some input on that too. So we can talk about that. Um, how about you guys over here? Yeah, director of fine arts. I'm a choir teacher and music teacher. Cool. Welcome. Appreciate it. Lex. Okay, great. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Out of school. Out of school. And um, but I, I, I know how important this, this is for school mm -hmm. and the lives of kids. Awesome. Great. I'm the and IT director for our schools. Um, and I agree on that last statement. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's, I'm excited to, to see what somebody else is doing in this area. Cool. Awesome. Great. And then I think we just um, yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, welcome guys. Well, thanks for coming. Well, let me introduce myself first of all. Um, my name is Miguel Amena. I am a, um, well, a teacher here in Maranatha, teaching for 10, here for five, former Disney designer. Um, yeah, I know, what am I doing here? Uh, <laughs> my wife says that. Um, it was my wife's idea. And um, yeah, and basically I, I'm new to the teaching field. I, uh, I was mostly an artist and designer for, you know, most of my career as classically trained in arts and, uh, career experience in the area of product design engineering. I worked at Disney Consumer Products here in Glendale, um, which is next door to the Imagineering group. So we kind of were very linked to each other. And my first introduction to 3D printing and makerspace was actually in the Disney Synergy Lab, which is um, its own make space where we create demos and, of products, lines, presentations. We even had a 3D printer in that location, which was a monster of a device, but um, that was my first introduction to 3D printing and what we were doing is basically making maquettes and different products from overseas that couldn't get shipped from China. So we, you know, companies would send 3D files and print them and a little six inch object would take like 10 hours to print back then. So um, I, that was my first sort of exposure to it. Um, my wife is a college counselor. Um, so I got into teaching because of her. And, um, and so uh, she thought, you know, um, you probably are a better teacher than you are an artist. I don't know what that meant, but um, I worked at Disney. So, and I was like, okay, but, um, but you should try this out because at the time I was teaching through the church. So uh, I was teaching kids classes through the church. I had, you know, good, uh, good rapport with them. And so she thought maybe you can try teaching something called a career technical education class. Um, which was ROP back in its day, which used to be a wood shop or those classes of the day. But um, here in California, we, they're basically right, like, you know, your graphic design classes. So she met someone who was a teacher. She thought maybe to try it for a year, see if you like it, take a break from the industry because that was about 2008, so everyone knows about the crash. Um, so it was definitely a wild time for corporations at, at that time. And I wanted something different because it was definitely a, a, a heavy hit for anyone working in any type of retail during that time, as we all know, and the pandemic sort of heightened that even more, I guess you can say to some degree. So, um, so yeah, so that's kind of the short story of it. Um, I kind of, I do, I am fascinated with technology, I'll say that. And, um, and um, I uh, consider myself a pattern seeker slash possibly undiagnosed autistic um, because my son was recently diagnosed with autism, well, three years ago. And from that process, I've learned a lot about um, how this STEM field to support those children with special needs, 
how I'm seeing that in his upbringing and how sort of how I used my education as a way to kind of um, uh, protect myself from like general education. So it's interesting because uh, thinking back up through it all, I'm like, oh, I wonder if, well, first of all, you think everyone thinks it's what you do. And then I realized, oh, wow, I think that my, everything that happened during that time was my reaction to the general education system. And so I ended up naturally falling into these fields, um, science, technology, arts, that use technology. And in the end, I used that as a way to kind of protect myself, buffer myself from like all the stress of like the general education environment. So that's a deep meaning of it all, but that's, um, yeah. So pattern seeking is kind of my thing. Um, this, this whole like finding an order to things and uh, I'm fascinated with things that are complex in their nature. But through that, uh, you see a lot of interesting insights in that process. So um, we're gonna go down a little bit of a, a rabbit hole. Um, and so, but I'll try not to be too complex in the presentation. Um, um, but I will share a couple of things during that time. Um, in high school, creativity was that thing for me. And so one of, the, one of my first tastes of like creativity and having an impact was um, through the uh, Starburst Creative Project. So basically um, when I was in high school, we, we had a journalism technology program. And then we had a really cool opportunity from the M&M Mars Corporation, which you know, Starburst, to create a commercial and they went uh, throughout Los Angeles looking for schools to compete. And my friend and, my, uh, and I, we won along with another school, specialized school in the arts. That was the commercial we created back in 96, 97. That was about 16 years old, 17 years old. And it was a really cool experience, but that was my first taste at like what, uh, what a creative idea can do and how far it can go. It was aired in um, uh, North and uh, South American networks. And we were like viral before it was ever a thing. And that was pre YouTube days and it was really fun. But that was sort of like our, my first introduction to like what an idea can do when it's um, exposed to technology and goes exponential essentially. So that was like my, my dose of adrenaline with that. Um, in college, I interned um, for uh, New Line Cinema, which at the time was a struggling uh, movie company about to launch a little film called The Lord of the Rings. And they were, we were on the verge of bankruptcy from when I was interning at the time. And then basically um, we had a small marketing team used, that used the internet to basically push the film um, to its like major status. Um, basically we used, um, I was hired to, as an intern to look at trends and research the trends through the internet. And from that detect like conversations and topics. And then from there, we created a marketing plan from those topics and responded to, uh, to, to the fans of you know, the Lord of the Rings trilogy with a, a very custom trailer that launched before the actual trailer. So, you know, back then it wasn't YouTube, it was uh, Apple trailers and things like that. You would watch, you know, the trailers and basically we, we, we did the launch of the trailer, pre-trailer to the actual trailer online and it became like, it like got the most views in a day, like over a million at the time, bigger than Star Wars. And it kind of like kickstarted fandom globally because now you can use this thing called the internet to like, like expand your brand outside of that. And before that it was like Star Trek and Star Wars, right, through, through North America. But now we have this other fan community that blew up and we can use the internet to kind of expand on that. So the technology use and the internet, you'll probably see a little bit of that kind of resonate a little bit. So I use that, we use that as a, I use that as a Kickstarter to kind of connect with students here on campus too. So that's kind of a sort of a, 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 a strategy that we used and the film was really cool. And obviously, um, yeah, the rest is history. So it's still happening today with Amazon Prime, but um, little did I know that that group, that little group was gonna have that much of an impact on, on the industry. So I'm very fortunate to be a part of that um, during that time. So again, research, find the trend, launch um, according to the trend and, uh, and target it based on what the needs of the fans are. So you've taken that data and just putting it out there. So that was really cool. Um, and then um, when I got into teaching, that's when the 3D printer started showing up because um, you know, based on my experience, my uh, coordinator uh, uh, through the public school uh, taught at Marshall here, which is a couple miles away. She uh, said, hey, would you be interested in maybe doing, um, we have a machine called a 3D printer and I don't know if you've heard about it. It's like, yeah, I've heard about it. Um, I used to work with it at Disney. She's like, well, the engineering uh, teacher, you know, is having a hard time using it. Would you be willing to try something out with it? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. Let's use it. I'll bring it into my classroom, which I was teaching art or graphic design specifically. And basically um, 
you know, here in, in Southern California, they, you know, typically the, what Disney does is that they'll hire, they'll hire the artists to do sort of, sort of the industrial design work because it's cheaper uh, labor that way. And so um, they, we basically would take some of the industrial design techniques and use that and create products out of them. Um, I just took that same idea and pushed it a step further and translated it to a 3D printer using a 3D program. And so I learned how to do the 3D program, did the art, used the basics, and then launched it that way. So we were basically making like products and sort of tools in the classroom during that time as of like an add-on to the art class. So we would like, at the time it was Tinkercad, but Tinkercad was sort of like rickety and it was sort of, it wasn't owned by, you know, the current company, but basically it was out there and I played with it a little bit to get the products done and printed them. And now it's like a very normal staple from it. So um, that's kind of what we did. And so the students that came into the class were middle and high school, because we were middle high school hybrid uh, of a school. And from there, the district was pretty excited from what they saw. And so they actually asked me to teach, um, if I'd be willing to teach um, all the teachers in the district how to use this machine, because they would like to uh, purchase one for every school so that they can sort of follow the same program. And so I said, sure, you know, we, um, if that's, if that's going to help, that's great. We basically invited teachers from all the schools, one science teacher, history teacher, art teacher, anyone who was interested in, le in learning it. And we did a training for, um, for a week. And then they, those teachers took the technology and the tools and used it in the classrooms. So then effectively, you know, outreaching to, you know, 18 something thousand students. So um, every school in Pasadena Unified, we were the first to do it district wide before it was a thing and then eventually everyone caught on to it. But we were pulling from, you know, this company and that unknown company and this just to kind of put it all together. Um, but that's, but we, we, but we made it work. And so from that, it turned into like this, this um, district wide event. So that was really cool. And from there, that's when I got a call from Maranatha because uh, when my son was born, I took two years off. And from there, I basically um, got an invite to come here. And when they showed me this space, I said, oh, great. Um, this is better than what we have before, so let's let's go for it. And so it's been four years since then, and it's been a great process. So hopefully everything you're going to see is what I've sort of picked together within the last 10 years, slash a little bit of some of the things I picked up throughout my career at, in the arts and Disney and things of that sort. And hopefully you'll see something that you can take home uh, with you. And so um, if you have questions, there, there's a lot, and we'll have a lot of time to kind of go over things. Um, we'll definitely talk a little bit about the philosophy um, the, how the classroom got converted, uh, pedagogy partnerships, student work uh, pathways, and I'll even uh, give you guys a little tour of the lab. So everything's running, all the bells and whistles are going off today. So you get a chance to walk through it and see how, uh, how it's all sort of formatted. So hopefully it'll be a, a benefit to you guys. Okay, so um, the Tile Lab basically means technology integration learning environment. Um, it is a space for where students can basically um, um, it was initially created from the former head of school to sort of teach vocation uh, to students. So that was sort of the original design of it. And I know that, you know, historically vocation and, and, and was agricultural that led to industrial, but, um, you know, within the makerspace world, it's really more, and you'll see in a moment, it's very, it's a very different sort of environment in terms of like vocation, although it does include that. Um, there's different formats, different sort of states of mind when you think about it. Uh, we have 25 Mac computers, um, nine 3D printers, a 175 watt laser cutter. Um, we have a full Adobe Creative Cloud software um, uh, subscription that all students get for free all four years here. Um, and we have a STEM, and we do have a STEM curriculum that we pull from through a company called Project Google. Um, we we think digitally, we think collaboratively, and ultimately, at a, as a Christian school, we want to serve others. So we we think a lot about tools, not toys here. And that's the first thing you'll notice right off the bat. Uh, students will always want to make toys. And the, the goal is to switch from a consumer to a creator of tools sort of mentality. I, I don't consume, I create. And I, don't, and I do more than create, I create to solve problems. And so that's sort of the, the, ge the genesis or the main idea of how we kind of operate it. Um, we put it to practice during the pandemic. Um, during, the, during the pandemic, I got really upset of the fact that we were running short on supplies. So, um, being a network community of makers, um, there was a file floating around of a doctor who basically um, created a mask uh, using a 3D printer and then cutting up a surgical mask, a one full surgical mask into smaller pieces and then putting that as the front of the mask um, and distributing it freely to, uh, to the makerspace community. 
I picked up the file, modified it, and we basically were running remotely here in the lab um, um, 24-7 during the pandemic. We were able to make masks, we delivered them to nurses and uh, at a hospital here in Kaiser, uh, city, of, city of Downey. And so it was a really successful project and program. And at the end of the day, it's pretty much a, a, a really good example of what we want students to do, is to help others using exponential technology in a very wicked problem or situation. And so this is probably best case scenario of what you would, I would like ultimately students to do with this technology in a successful makerspace. Now, the byproduct, I would never imagine um, this happening, but the story um, got picked up by two students in Japan and those students um, found the article um, and they basically took um, the, the information, contacted me through LinkedIn and said, we wanna do what you did in our, in Tokyo and we'd be interested in working with you. And so from that, we uh, met online through Zoom and um, we basically collaborated and, and gave them the files and gave them instructions with their coordinator. And next thing you know, what we were working on here in the States turned into like an international thing and, and, and helping people in Tokyo. Um, um, their teacher, their school, their high school, they were, they were very, very um, open and they made things happen and they were able to support it. So this was a really great example of how this could go viral very quickly and just having an example of it was available too. And then of course the nurses here locally got those masks and they were distributed. And from there, it just kind of grew from one person to the next. So that's kind of how we sort of operated. And that's sort of like the one of the best things or the best scenarios you can think of for students to go. And again, my students saw this happen in real time and they were able to build off of that. But, but I always like to kind of hit the brakes, kind of backtrack a little bit and talk a little bit about cathedrals because um, um, cathedrals are, are a really cool sort of space um, for engineering, uh, especially the stained glass. And people always say like, how did the two relate? But when you really think about it, you know, um, when the, when the arches were created in, in the cathedral, this is the Saint-Chapelle Cathedral in France. Um, because of this advancement of technology, a new medium of communication was formed. And as a result, we were, uh, you know, people that were illiterate were able to learn, you know, everything about the Bible on every panel throughout the space. So the cathedral is a really great example of what like the built environment um, can do to enable reflection and human endeavor, right? Um, stained glass workers of the time were very much like uh, startup workers that we have today. Um, it took 200 years to make a cathedral, but stained glass took only you know days, weeks, right, to create, if not months. Um, so these workers, these new skilled workforce laborers, were literally traveling all throughout Europe and basically uh, creating stained glass, perfecting their craft, and getting work everywhere. And all this through the advancement of the technology, which opened up this new field. Um, I believe the makerspace is, is kind of like at the beginning of something. So, um, can't, quite pick, can't quite pick out what that is, but it's definitely more than what it may seem. And it might take decades before it's for it to mature, but it's, it's definitely showing we're at the beginning of something that is very similar to that time. And you could probably relate it to the International Space Station in some ways. Um, perhaps this is like a precursor to, you know, what, you know, um, future colonies and space exploration, now that we're hitting this new era of Mars exploration and, and going to the moon and colonization, we might be seeing a new type of environment where, where a potential new medium or mixture of mediums could be emerging and that these students will be the first generation to kind of encounter that um, because they think differently in terms of how um, they think in terms of the technology, meaning um, when you're in a space that's completely networked uh, together, it changes your behavior, right? You energy, tr you lose track of time in some ways. When you're very engaged with all the tools, I mean, you could probably, sit, you know, maybe some, maybe all you guys know, like if you watch Netflix, you can sit and, you know, and binge on Netflix forever and lose track of time in some ways and not know, right? The, the, the platform and the tools and technology just completely immerse you and you just lose all track. Imagine you take that to a whole another level times, you know, 10. And what does that do to, to a super user, right? Um, they, you know, granted the astronauts up there, they see, you know, they see the sunrise and set 20 times, but um, up there, um, the there's, a, there's a different energy. There's, um, there's definitely more happening. The, the human factor kind of 
starts to change in some ways. And this whole notion of like me being connected to networks becomes like this whole massive thing. Back on earth, same thing, right? You have medical doctors that are using high technologies for surgeries. They can't do what they do without that technology. Um, you know, you think of the Pentagon, you think of just any space that uses technology and probably the elevator here is the best example. You know, that space doesn't actively work unless it relies and depends on the technology at the end of the day. So that's sort of the philosophy behind that because most people will look at a makerspace as your traditional sort of wood shop class. I know I did in the beginning. Um, and they'll look at that as sort of like the space where I you know, get vocational training and, um, and I just kind of go from there and end up with work. Whereas, you know, obviously you guys know today it's a lot more different, right? There's so many different types of spaces out there, different designs, different configurations, but they really kind of follow three different variations at the end of the day. Um, there's your library makerspace, which creates knowledge. There's your dedicated makerspace, which is what we're in, a dedicated classroom space for that. Uh, and then there's your maker card or mini maker spaces, right? Um, so um, if you're like, it, there's different, that's generally what it is. Like elementary schools, I'd seen more of the maker card mini space, high schools, middle schools, maybe middle schools, and you'll see a little, little a library or maker space. And then maybe most high schools will have a dedicated classroom space because of the, the vocational training and the potential for college um, and career training. So that's sort of the formats that you see with that. Um, and makers do kind of look at the arts and crafts movement as sort of that format. Um, we kind of look at it as more this than that. Um, although we do maximize vocation here, um, but when it comes to making, I, I do feel like students do like to, the process of creating for the sake of creation and then they end up getting an interesting career um, as a possibility. So here we format to like explore, create, and if they really get interested in that first year class or that workshop, then it could potentially turn into um, this advanced sort of career thing. But the arts and crafts movement is a little bit more closely related to the sentiment of the makerspace where it's all about hands-on experience, reflection to gain understanding and, and, and this democratization of culture, art and beauty. Whereas today it's more about technology, right? Um, how do we democratize technology? And of course, what happens when you network everything? What happens when technology becomes, um, infiltrates the physical environment, right? I, thought, I think when I first started, I was really interested in like this whole physical digital realm, how like this digital file becomes physical and how this physical thing I can take and put a digital and distribute it across the world. That was really interesting to me, um, especially seeing it at like at a Disney. And so what happens when, when the technology becomes a big player in this game, right? Um, Obviously, the, the social dilemma becomes a big part of that because there's influences that happen and platforms that connect us also have some type of control over us. So when I go into this field, you, I felt like the, some students kind of looked at the technology a little bit as like, well, isn't this typically used to make toys or is this used to make sort of like weapons? Can I 3D print, you know, like a gun? I got a lot of that in the beginning. And I was like, well, you know, you get 3D print you can make a weapon out of Home Depot parts, but you know, at the end of the day, you really wanna build things that help people. And so there's that mentality that you wanna really kind of instill early in your students. And I really communicate this message about um, realigning technology with the best interest of, of students or humanity, right? And that's kind of how we look at that, right? There's a really great organization called the Center for Human Technology. And they basically um, are, they are the former Google, YouTube, Facebook, program managers who felt extremely guilty for what they built and now are trying to reverse that. Um, they're, and they created an, an organization that basically is trying to reverse everything that they did um, in their um, 20s and early 30s. And their format is a little different. They believe in um, respecting human nature. Um, they believe in minimizing harmful consequences. They're centered on values. Um, they create shared understanding, they support fairness and justice, and they help people thrive. Um, here at Maranatha, uh, we really lean in on the um, values portion of it, centering on values, because wherever you set up your makerspace, your school values can come into that, right? Like that's what makes a space so different. Um, what are your values in your location, in your schools, in your work environments, right? Because these places even exist in corporations and studios and work. And how do they, how do you instill that into the values of, uh, of your school organization? 
And so this, uh, this conversation is, is currently ongoing. And, you know, the first step has, has already come into the form of awareness, right? So I think about a year or two ago, that film, Social Dilemma, came out on Netflix. And now it's instilling policy, which is now leading to regulation, which then leads to adoption by the future technologists and current technologists, uh, which leads to solutions uh, that follow this new framework, which ultimately, you know, God willing, leads to human flourishment, um, you know, alignment being better, supporting human needs and values, um, and essentially reversing it, right? So where we fit, or where I think this model kind of fits is in the adoption solutions part, um, where we kind of take our space and we um, instill some of these new values, these new methods, this framework to the future technologists, which are our students, to um, having projects that are uh, real world problems. So, you know, it's, it's okay to try to tackle global warming in, in your advanced level engineering class, right? Because we did that. We actually, that was one of our final projects selected by students was like, how do we reverse global warming? And so, um, and more specifically, how do we do it here at school? And so that kind of made it more targeted. And then they created these really great solutions from that. Um, and then from there, your, your values show up, you can implement them and that will make a really cool space at the end of the day, which I think is really cool. So that's kind of the, the framework and where we kind of plug in here as a school. Um, and you can plug in your values as well within your institutions. So the question is, where do we begin? Like, where does this all kind of fall into place at the end of the day? Um, well, um, I'll go over the things that I think don't get mentioned. So these are like six things that pretty much are more important than actually getting started, which is um, you have to make a decision, right? Are you going to design something? Are you going to fabricate and only 3D print or are you going to do both, right? Because there is a difference, right? Like you could take out the printers and just design 3D model and call it a day um, and teach just general engineering and maybe have some robotics as a component. Um, or are you going to, you know, actually build, physically build and fabricate these things and modify them, make them better, um, or do a combination of two? Here, we do both, right? Um, and so we do design, which you'll see in our uh, Mac lab, um, two doors down, fabrication, which is the center port part of the lab. And then this space is sort of like our computer science coding slash sort of creative strategy room. Um, um, and so we do that and set it up in that configuration. You don't necessarily have to do that. Um, in my former classroom, which was just one, I literally took like a quarter of the room and just dedicated it for 3D printing, put one old computer PC there, and basically um, that's what we did. We just made a dedicated corner a section of the table with a printer and a computer, and you can get started that way, and that's okay too. So that's, that's how I started, and then little by little, you, you add up one more printer or another printer or a parent donates, you know, um, a gift card to buy a machine. They're fairly inexpensive starting and so you can literally get started for hundreds of dollars and not have to put in thousands or tens of thousands unless you really, really want to. So um, it all depends on what your outcomes are at the end of the day. Um, do you want a clean room or a dirty room? <laughs> because dirty versus clean is going to be a big factor. So um, I think um, we're a little bit of both in some ways. I do tend to be a bit of a clean freak, but it does get dirty fast. So um, be aware that you want to know where you want to, how, how clean do you want or how dirty do you want it? because it could be as clean as something like this, which is kind of what I tend to prefer, um, but it could be very chaotic. So be ready for smoke. Um, we be ready for parents potential. Well, if you have filters that are having issues um, perhaps, but here we, 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 we laser cut so much that we you know, scared our admin because she thought the building was on fire because the smoke had gotten out um, because the filters didn't sustain enough of the smoke, right? So little things like that. Um, but that was, they didn't expect so much activity from it, but these are things that are real, right? Do, do we expect dirty space or a clean space? Um, we had a parent too, because we had an exhaust system here for a laser. Um, we were laser cutting all day, smoke came out, parents freaked out, they thought the building was on fire. And so um, it's just one of those things where it's like, oh, um, be ready for some noise, be ready for some movement because it does get a little bit loud in the space. So that leads to the third tenant, which is noise control. Um, um, if you're setting up a space, be aware that you might want to think about the noise level, and that depends on your machine, right? Most 3D printers are not too loud unless you have many, uh, not, you know, a dozen or more running, but there are certain, some machines like CNC machines, laser cutters, they do make a significant amount of noise, and so um, 
wherever you set up your space, um, however, whatever level of equipment, if you wanna do a major space, just have a dedicated space and know that there will be a level of noise coming from that space. So um, we're next to an art room, um, you know, but, and this is mostly the wing, this wing of the building and classes on the other side, administration in the middle, but we do take us, we do make noise in this place, right? We're constantly in communication, um, you know, things are moving, parts are moving, people are, are talking. So you could hear us, you know, well into the other side of the, almost all the other side of the building. So if you do have more equipment in the future, noise will be a factor. Um, you could take, you know, an old wood shop if you have an old wood shop on your campus or a classroom on the corner of, a, of your campus and then convert that if you wanted to. But there is a level of noise that you want to factor into because that that's becomes an issue. Um, electrical requirements. Um, I mentioned a laser cutter. Um, our laser cutter is 75 watts. It takes, it doesn't use a standard plug or outlet. So you really want to think about what, what the electrical requirements are going to be. Um, are you going to have multiple computers operating in that space? You're going to need power for that, of course. But you're going to need to also be aware that you might need a 220 volt or 220 volt um, outlet installed in, in, your, in your space to, to get a big laser cutter. And you can get a small one too, which uses like your standard plug and that's fine. But if you're very serious and want to um, level up this maker space to be a, a full pathway to college, then there are electrical requirements you might want to take into, into the apartment. Um, I do like the, the cores that come down from the ceiling because um, very quickly, if you have so many laptops moving around, uh, especially in like a space like this, you, you definitely want those overhead cords to kind of follow your space because it would be helpful. And that's actually what we ordered this year is to get some overhead cores because we have PCs and laptops and running around in some cords and things like that. It can be a little tricky moving around your space. So electric uh, electrical requirements are, are good and IT folks can always take a look at the space to see what that looks like. Um, furniture, um, very surprising how storage is often overlooked <laughs> or missed um, because most furniture you know, it tends to look like this, very fancy, very clean, very modern for presentations, for tours. But then you forget that you, you have so much storage, robotic components, parts, things like that. You're going to need something that kind of accommodates for both. So a so furniture that, that has storage optimized is great. Um, definitely um, different sizing or different uh, seating arrangements is a great thing to have because in the beginning, our makerspace was looked at a little bit as sterile and students didn't know what to make of it before I arrived. It was sort of, a lot of people thought that if you build it, they will come. And that wasn't quite the case. Um, students didn't know if they would have access or not. They didn't know if they were allowed in a room. They didn't know if they could touch something or not. They didn't know how to use them. Some may have learned through middle school or on the internet, but not everyone felt like they could touch things, if that makes sense. And so, um, when I got called in, I had to sort of change that thinking a little bit. And so one of the things I tried to do is try to show different arrangements of seating so that it, it was a welcoming environment. Um, I often like to think of it as a cross between like a Starbucks and Apple Store, right? Um, as clean as Apple Store is technically proficient with geniuses coming up to you, seeking you out, but as uh, comfortable as a Starbucks where you can come and work for hours on end. So if you can mix those two, what does that look like? I like to hopefully think that's something that we do here. So, you know, so having someone as a support, always available, always willing to serve, right? Always um, able to answer, answer questions and create events, right? There's a lot of culture in a Starbucks and there's always uh, things related to certain seasons. So we do the same thing here as you'll see in a moment. So anything with wheels is great. Anything with different size, uh, different sizes and you know, um, patterns, basically programmable, movable type of furniture is always a great thing to have. So mobility is um, key for that too. Okay. Okay. Any questions at this point? You guys are okay? <laughs> it's a lot of information, but we'll have, we'll do the tour in just a few moments. Here. Um, in terms of the teaching pedagogy, project based learning. Okay. PBL, great. Um, we partnered with Project Lead the Way. So um, here we use the makerspace. We started off with in, um, introduction to uh, computer. We did. Uh, the introduction to computer aided design and then one of the findings i had here was that well we live in pasadena this is a arts and engineering town we don't offer engineering why don't we offer engineering um we're very good at the arts here and so um as a christian school we value the arts but we have generations of of nasa jpl engineers that also come to us and so we had nothing available for them at the time 
we had science classes, we had competition, but, but nothing as robust as like a, a full program. So um, after my first year, I switched the name to uh, Computer Aided Design and Engineering. And then we partnered with Project Lead the Way, which offers um, content curriculum training from as early as elementary school all the way to high school. And it's designed with a project-based minds uh, set to it. So we, uh, we do the training, um, it's a summer. Um, if your teacher, let's say, decides to leave your school or quit, the training is free for the next new teacher. You just send them, they learn the curriculum and your program stays alive. Because one of the reasons is that if something were to happen or if I needed to move on for whatever reason, I don't want this thing to die. So the Project Lead the Way was the next best thing. They are a nonprofit. They're the best in the nation and they've been promoted by um, you know, presidents here in the United States. So, um, and they have a long standing run um, with educating students. Um, really good content, really good projects. I modify them every now and again, but um, they're very, very proactive across the nation and they're probably the best. So you'll often will find a lot of them um, sprinkled around different campuses, high schools, um, public schools, they would use the same content as well. So, um, and they, offer, they also offer robotics, game design, um, aerospace engineering. So you name it, they, they pretty much kind of supply you for it. And, and training is, is key. You don't have to worry about training at any point, which is great. Um, their framework is quite simple. Um, look closely, explore the complexity of a system, in this case, the engineering of something or, or an object. And then can you find an opportunity? Can you actually like make it better? Um, so that's, the, that's sort of the, the centering of it all. And the mindset of a student when they're done should be something that is multiple solutions oriented, thinking, reflection on a deeper, with, on a deeper level, carefully planned, executed, changes made accordingly, thinking outside of the box to solve a problem. Um, when your students are thinking, talking this way, um, then you know you're kind of moving in the right direction because um, it's not just like, can you, what's the, how do I do this one time or I need to do it this way? Um, I really try to kind of, have them problem solve and, and kind of work with them through that problem solving process. So what does that look like? Um, so looking at this, the one, uh, the, we have a rocket club here and they have really um, are starting to adopt 3D printing and first they would do everything by hand. Now they're starting to like really come in and like look at the potential of like, oh, I can 3D print a rocket, we can launch it. Oh, this is what's used currently at like a Tesla or excuse me, at SpaceX. I got a chance to tour that facility. And so they do have 3D printers in that space. Um, and there's a company here in Long Beach uh, called Relativity, which is the first company to 3D print a full rocket using robotics from scratch. We had a guest speaker from that company during the pandemic, Kushbu, and she basically confirmed that uh, they want to be the first company on the planet to fully 3D print a rocket going to orbit and put that technology on the moon, which would then push rockets to Mars and back. And so they've been funded. It's actually a former uh, SpaceX engineer and um, who quit and basically said, we could just 3D print the whole thing. Why do we got to build this thing? And, um, and he built these two massive robotic arms that did it. And during the pandemic, that machine was running 24 seven while they um, remotely controlled it from home, um, all the workers. So they worked at home and then the, machine, the robot did the work. That gave me the idea for um, what we did with the, with the mass, right? It's the future of work at the end of the day. Um, work will be a state of mind, not a place. And so that is um, a tenant for something to think about in the future. And everyone knows, right? We all had to work from home and we had to be at work at one moment and be at home the next moment. And Zoom was the technology we all had to learn quickly in order to adjust and learn, right? So the pandemic was proof of the first sort of pandemic project-based lesson we never wanted. <laughs> and, um, and we did, uh, lean into that technology in the pandemic and we did some cool things with them too. Um, empowerment is the key. Um, if your students are empowered, then you've done a good job. Um, do they feel um, that they have a capacity to change their world? Do they feel like they can make a difference? Do they feel like they can be the first in their family to go into STEM? Um, do they feel that um, they can um, be in engineering or in the field as a woman? Because there's a lot of guys and most um, start to lose interest in after middle school, right? So you gotta catch them young. Um, empowerment is, is, is the key to it all. And so if they're walking away empowered, you did a good job. Okay. Um, how do I build the community? Okay. Um, well, I basically did these three things. Um, when I first started, um, there was no community at all. In fact, they were like, didn't wanna come into the room. 
<laughs> because they were too scared to touch stuff. And so I basically use a digital promise framework, which is a maker model or maker leadership framework. It's great. Um, they have different assessment tools to see where you are in your, in your maker space and the levels and the sizes. But we basically started with a vision, right? Um, we believe in creativity. We believe in God-given creativity, right? Genesis 1, chapter 1. In the beginning, God created. First five words in the Bible is about God's creativity. So we use that as a core value that we push from the, from the left. And so from there, we established that vision, like, hey, you're creative, you're God's creative, we want to be doing creative things in this space. So let's bring that up to, up to speed, um, which leads to building a culture, right? Um, you know, we took our printers, we used it, um, them to the maximum capabilities, and we basically had to just engage the community, right? Um, our students always go to convocation, which is like the gym over here. And... Um, and we basically started, I started communicating through them through, through the convocation and the meetings. Um, just building that vision, throwing the vision out there um, and trying to get them in the room to build that culture. Once the culture is established, then you have the makings of a program because then you have students that come often that may be interested in going into a career into this field if they want to or not, or be willing to explore or just come into the space and try to make something for another class and, and show the cross-curricular um, connections, right? Um, oh, this connects with my calculus class? Really? Oh, the graphics on this program is related to the, this formula? I did not know that. And so making those connections is really important as you know, as educators. So that was a great thing to see. So going from that narrow sort of focus of a project to like, oh, this connects to like all these other disciplines is really at the heart of what makes um, the project great, right? And like I said, for, the con for convocation where we did our community um, meetings, um, I would basically create videos. Um, again, uh, it's like Starbucks and Apple mixed into one. So I started uh, video editing because as a creator, we did that. And, you know, Disney, we, we did all the things, emails, videos, all that stuff. So I took a crack at it and basically found footage online that I just kind of spliced together, edited from different companies, and then kind of brought it in, put some music to it. And then from there, started communicating like almost like a business in a way, right? Like, guys, um, this event is from December 4th to the 13th. Make anything you want. These are all the things that you can create from it. Check this out. Literally, it was like a you know, two-minute announcement. But that really engages the students, gets their attention, right? Sometimes they, they're told so much that once you start putting a video in front of them, then you start talking their language, right? This generation is a very visual generation. And so we kind of think along those lenses here in the lab. And so that um, opens up opportunities for the visual artists to call, also thrive in the space. So like I have interns in the program and they'll be coming in next year to help with marketing and videos and, and putting it all together. And that's another area where they can thrive, right? Where it's like, I'm not quite an engineer mind, but I am a designer. So I'm willing to go through this program for the, for the design aspect of it and the experience of making. Um, but ultimately I want to do this. And we have students that do that, and which is really, really great. So we do video promotions, which is really great. Um, I like data. So we were tracking and during that first semester, um, it took three months to crack the code <laughs> because uh, it was a lot of, how did it work? How does the culture work? Why are students coming? Um, once we figured out that it was really an access issue, a sterile perception you know, issue, um, then I started reversing that and saying, oh, no, we are creative, we are messy, we are dirty, we get our hands, um, you know, into the work. There's no right or wrong. It's not a grade. It's just an experience, right? And um, from there, uh, by the end of the first year, you know, almost like a thousand students visited, right? Um, mostly male. And then the, the, within year two, we tried to pick that number up um, with, by, act, by engaging more of the women through our talks and women in STEM series. Uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays at lunch were more popular days um, that students would come. We had a, we had a, a unique schedule, basically, um, for multiple reasons. It, we, had, we went down to six classes. We were up to seven, uh, seventh class uh, rotation uh, when I first started, and we went down to six for timing. But, um, but they mostly came on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, um, pre-pandemic. And, um, and from there, um, after school, they would go to their uh, sports training. So there was no after school anything because they did sports after school. So the only time to catch them was during break and lunch. And so those are the, so those times became critical. Thankfully, um, after the pandemic, we, we created business lunches 
which were extended lunches so that groups can meet during lunch because they couldn't meet after school due to their sports um, uh, signups and all their trainings that they were doing. So we just extended our lunch time and put all the events in during lunch and students would come design and create during that almost like a double block or, or almost like two class lengths of lunch time, if that makes sense. Um, and we, we even modified our, our class um, so that we had um, three days out of the week, we had 45 minute classes. And then one day out of the week, we had a 90 minute class. And that was uh, help arts classes or art classes or design classes like operate at a longer period because 45 minutes is really not enough time to do this, although you can, you can make it work. I did. But once we hit the 90 minutes, it really helps go deeper into some of the project and the work and it helped the scheduling a little bit too. So, um, but that's a more of a uh, registrar and sort of master plan sort of person. Yeah. So do you not have like, I want to sign up for the maker class? Um, that is, no, we have clubs and the clubs turn into the class. So the, so those events that I was showing you, like this event here, like we had a Christmas event, Valentine's event, right? Those were like little workshops to create and make. Students would come, we would engage, talk, interact. I would explain things, help them make a project. And that was sort of like the club or the workshop. So they had like this hyper sort of workshop. And then from there it turned into like, would you like to sign up for the class? And, and it's an elective class, right? Take it for a year, we will focus on this. So it was also promo at the same time. And then the, if the students were interested, they would take it, come in and then try it. If not, they would just come to our annual event and, and do projects or come in on their own and do a separate project on that business lunch and work that out. And so we use that as an opportunity. So was, I had students that literally would just, they, ne they never signed up for my class, but they would just sit in during their open block or during that lunch. And they just went with us during that time. And I was like, oh, this is wonderful. Like, it's very cool. And they just, they just sat in because they wanted to learn and that's how they made it work. So sometimes you see them for like a semester and then they, you know, they go off and do something else or go home if they're a senior. And that's how they normally did it. So, so you have yeah. classes mm -hmm. and you have events. Yes. Yeah. So like little workshops throughout that during lunch. Mm -hmm. Do you then do the classes advance from the freshman to senior? Yes. Or is it the same? Uh, three years. We had a CAD level one. So computer aid design level one, which is uh, engineering essentials. Uh, we have level two, which is introduction to engineering, which goes into the data and the science of it. And then we went into year three, which is like a research-based project. And we go and select a, a project for the entire year to work on. Um, that's a nice exposure to the overall field because then you do the design, you do the data, and then you do the delivery of a solution to a separate client. And then the students in the year three would have to present to a panel of teachers, experts, and basically um, defend, like a senior defense, their project and why they came up to in that way. And so our first cohort did complete that, they, 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 and they built their final project in that way. Um, if it was like a design class or artist class, you know, it would, it would basically be, you know, a, a yearbook final, and then you use some production level type thing, right? Um, and that could be part of your major space, right? And you use a printer instead of a 3D printer, you use a paper printer, large format printer. Um, so there's a lot of applications in different areas. It just depends if you want a class or a program. Um, I was aiming for the program, but it started off as a, uh, as a class to see what, how we would do it. And then it turned into a program in like three years, basically. Every year, you know, more students came. And then it was like, okay, we don't have a year two, let's offer year two. We don't have a year three, let's offer year three. Do you want to? Yes. Can you? Absolutely. And so then we finally finished that cohort in three years. You could do it in four, but I felt like three is a good number because that you give them one year to do something completely different. Like I want to do computer science or I want to do fine art or I want to try something else or I want to, you know, like you don't want them to feel locked in and, in any way. You want to give them options and, and choice. And so three years is like a good sweet spot for when, it, when it comes to that time. So, that would be the year three. Um, so year three is like, and it, it, it actually operates as an AP research or AP um, seminar class, very similar to that, where we research for an entire semester of the problem and look at it from a first principles point of view instead of a reverse engineering. Reverse engineering is covered, but they have to think about, you know, like there's no answer to this. So you have to think from the bottom up, right? Um, so we think in first principles and then we go one semester of that and then second semester is proving that principle and doing a prototype. 
um, that's that's meaningful, that's helpful when they do that at college because they'll give you a project to do for an entire semester. Here, they cover that, they're prepared for that. And, and then they present. Sometimes they go a little crazy because they're like, I'm doing the same thing for an entire year. Um, but it's it's part of the process. Like, you know, you have, sometimes you need time to work on a very intense, complex pro project. So, um, projects that we created in the very beginning, this is from my first couple of years of doing this program back in 2012. Um, we did cell phone cases with designs and patterns into it. That was a math teacher that I worked with in my former school. The, the, the music teacher didn't have trumpet mouthpieces because the metal parts were took forever to ship. So we 3D printed them in a few hours and that actually supplied him with materials. So we were able to make uh, supplement materials for the music department, um, saved them you know, thousands of dollars. You know, I broke my piece, it's, I can't wait a week or two to just print it for me. Um, so we printed a lot of, of, of those of mouthpieces. Um, laser cut projects, as you saw, we can laser engrave onto metal like your cell phone or your computer. We can laser engrave onto skateboards. Uh, we even made wood engravings for the ribbons or the, um, the cords for graduation. So we made like a little like um, medallion for the completion of the program. And so um, students take that with them and they have that as a, as a keepsake for the completion of the program for three years. Some, that tactile, that, that, that physical thing that they take with them is really great. Um, we created the uh, Ro Corsi Rosenthal uh, air filters, which, is, which was basically like a $50 air filter that, that um, kept your room uh, safe from COVID. Um, COVID um, pitches a ride on air particles. This machine for $50 sucks out the moisture from the air and basically gives your room a safe space. Uh, we use engineering and data to track it, and then we distribute it to different classes, right? Helping other people. Um, and so we were able to build that and do that in a semester. And there's, you'll see in a minute that there's two in my room. So um, that's how I keep that space super, super safe. You can too. Um, because of the low numbers of girls coming in, we wanted to address that problem. It's, a, it's not a school issue, it's a global issue. 30% um, of women are in STEM fields. They fall off after middle schools. They, there's typically not many programs during high school. If you want a sustainable planet, especially with global warming, um, we need all hands on deck. So we need all women to be a, a big part of this. And so, um, so we uh, are addressing that issue. Um, and that's a, and then that's a core value for us, right? We want women to be a part of this and we want them to lead in this. So we had our first women's robotics club that launched this past year. And during the pandemic on Zoom, we, um, I just cold called uh, on LinkedIn a bunch of people through the neighboring uh, companies and said, do you have someone that might be willing to talk to our school? I know you guys are home. So can they take a lunch break and maybe talk to our students and encourage them during this time? And they said, yes. And um, Kushbu and Jasmine Rando, they're from that relativity company. They spoke to us. Kushbu was amazing. She basically talked about harassment in the workplace. Um, at Virgin Atlantic or Galactic. Um, and she was very transparent, but her, her company supported her and they said that, you know, if you want to be in this field, be ready to face some issues. And so um, Karina in the center there, um, I had a conversation with her. I said, you do realize after everything we learned, you're going to face some, some issue and opposition for perhaps. And she's like, I'm ready for it. That, she, that showed me she was empowered. And I knew that she was going to be okay. So I was super proud that she was like, I'm ready for that. And I want to make a difference because I really like what I did. So that's, that was really, really uh, powerful. Then. Student showcases, we were able to um, take our fourth year students or, or actually final or interns because we have interns in the program. Um, if you do a program, interns are great because in the fourth year, if there's nothing, just make them in an intern or a teacher's aide. And then they do and help you set the programs, do the work and do showcases. So we have an art show every year on campus and our interns, um, Charlie and uh, Josh, um, they were taking, uh, they had an extra class. They took my third year. They loved it so much. They became interns. We programmed it in and they basically helped me do a student art showcase where we built this physical 3D printed sculpture um, and showcase it through, through our art show. And so um, here we see us, you know, building it, putting it all together, you know, like really collaborating, right? Like figuring out how things work, how to build it. They had solutions. I had solutions. It was really a, a reverse mentorship at the end of the day. Um, but um, we, we collaborated and that's a 21st century skill we want all our students to have is to have collaboration. Um, so it came out really well, really happy for the work that we did. And you'll see that uh, next door in just a few moments there, but 
we essentially 3D printed, we started with a 3D printed sort of piece um, and then um, by hand, um, we molded it and put and placed it onto a metal sort of chandelier, so to speak. So it's kind of like a, a 3D printed organic sculpture, so to speak. So that we went into that area and it was completely new to us, which was, which was great. Um, student exploration becomes a really interesting topic too, because um, during the pandemic, uh, VR is becoming more and more easily accessible. And so VR is the next um, frontier for us, I would say. We're gonna explore VR next year as a wellness tool, um, as a tool to, uh, for architecture as well. Basically everything you could do on a laptop, you could, possibly, you could do on your VR headset now. Um, and so Philip, um, during the pandemic, um, he's home. Um, I'm at, on campus and we're both interacting in this virtual class or virtual space. And that purple thing you just saw a moment ago was a, a 3D modeled um, propeller that he did in a program called Onshape um, and then imported it into the classroom space. And then we were able to kind of like interact. So you can kind of see me there in the upper right. I'm, I'm walking around, that's me there on the left and Philip's at home on his um, Quest One headset. And we're basically able to kind of be in this virtual sort of space. And there's that 3D model that we were able to import. Philip figured out how to import the file and then we were able to manipulate it all within VR. And this is a free program and running on the internet. So no software required, no cost required. So cloud-based anything is a really good thing. Um, and now you can do CloudCAD for free. You, can, you don't have to put an investment on software. All you need is a computer. Chrome, uh, a Chrome computer can do this um, because it's designed for Chrome. Um, and really that's it. I mean, you can do this on any device. As long as you have an internet connection, you are good to go. If you have a 3D printer, even better, not necessary, but um, we're, gonna, we're gonna do a lot of engineering and modeling related through VR and, and we're gonna explore that a little bit more. And the trend is, is that Apple will, will likely release it within the next year or two. And so, you know, I, I'm a, I, I tend to call myself a pattern seeker. So I'm starting to see that pattern a little bit in the, in the industry and the money. And um, it's a big industry. So we're trying to align that with students and for jobs in the future. So we see that as a possibility there. Um, our, uh, this is our first class I completed um, that stuck with me through the pandemic. Um, we had a small number because we launched CAD 3 during the pandemic. So we weren't able to tell students um, or promote it effectively, but I was able to get my first couple of year students uh, in and the other half graduated. So they didn't know there was a year three. So this year um, we doubled our numbers for, for our CAT 3 class. It's about a 50% pass through, like from class one, 50% go to year two, and then 100% in year three. Uh, so they stick with it the third year. Um, they got accepted to Cal Poly Pomona, great engineering school. They got accepted to UC Berkeley, a um, couple of private schools. Um, and uh, Philip's gonna be doing environmental uh, engineering. He wants to work on sustainability. So they're all going to really good schools. And from what I'm hearing, um, when they toured, uh, Berkeley has a similar look and feel to our space, similar projects. Um, Cal Poly takes it a little bit further, um, stuff we haven't seen before. So that's how uh, Kareen selected her program. She's like, I saw everything in what, at Berkeley, they had everything we do. It's like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if it's gonna help you. And she's like, but Cal Poly actually did things I didn't ever see. And, I, and that's made her decision to go. So she ended up going to Cal Poly and um, yeah, so proud of her. So um, last couple of slides, um, where are we going? Where, what are the plans for this you know, program? Um, I envision seven more different pathways um, focusing on all things of the future. Um, so multi-planetary science, sustainability, um, entrepreneurship, in, in metaverse interactive media, machine learning, artificial intelligence, automation, robotics, bioengineering. Uh, these are the industries of tomorrow. And so we um, are talking, I mean, I threw this proposal, but the first likely program after this will probably be entrepreneurship because that's the easier buy and launch after that. But um, a pathway program is a lot better sounding than a, an academy in some ways, um, just because the pathway program helps students make better decisions. So it's kind of like a mini college in a way where it's like, here are your choices, here are your selections, um, here's your experiences. If you like it, great. If not, then you can switch to something else. Um, it will require some, some, diff some changes, but other things that we're doing is um, we're gonna do is senior exposition. So we wanna have students basically um, uh, do presentations. So we kind of started that last year, but we wanna go deeper into the presentations. 
So um, the USC Ivine Academy, which is kind of like what we do, but on a col on university college level, um, they take entrances, their, their students have to create a video of a, of a solution or product they created. So we want to get students prepared for that. And so we want to do um, expositions where they're creating presentations of their solutions to problems and making videos for that and defending that in front of a panel of experts. So well, we're envisioning that for students in the future. And we kicked it off this past year. So we're going to improve on, the, on our systems and processes, which is really great. And at the end of the day, um, this is our vision, right? We want to be a Christ-centered accelerator for student-led impact. So um, hopefully we're doing it and that's helpful. But that concludes the presentation, so thanks. <laughs> um, if you got some feedback, feel free. We're gonna go take a little walk next door so you can take a look at some of the tools and the, and the, and the gears and I can answer any questions that you guys might have. But um, let me go ahead and stop the video there and it, it can kind of go from there, so. Do you want to skip that presentation? Uh, yes, I think we're gonna put this in a, in a 